Donica Markegaard. Everybody feeling inspired? Woo! Ah, oh, beautiful country you have. I'm so thankful for the trees and the green grass and the rain. Is everybody feeling thankful for the rain? Yeah. All right. So I come from the San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, our family, I have, uh, along with my husband and our four kids, uh, we steward vast uh, coastal grasslands. And we do this through regenerative agriculture practices, which mimic nature and produce more life than every life that we take. And it's more life in the form of biodiversity in the form of plant species. We have 137 plant species growing on one ranch alone. There's not many farmers that can boast that much plant diversity on their farm. Um, so, and at the same time, we're producing nutrient-dense food for thousands of families, for our community. And, so how did I get started in this? Um, well, I was raised primarily a vegetarian um, with an environmentalist mother. And like Greta, at 15 years old, I walked out of school and, uh, because I knew there was something else. Um, I wasn't being fulfilled. My passions weren't, weren't being... Uh, exercised. So I was searching, searching for something else, searching for solutions of uh, destruction and greed that I saw. And when I traveled around the country, I just saw more destruction, uh, more destruction in the form of monocultures, uh, factory farms. And so when I came home, I, through synchronicity, immersed in a wilderness school. So my entire high school was nature. And Mother Nature was my primary teacher and still is to this day. So here I am tracking a, a mountain lion. And nature functions in holes and patterns. Everything is interconnected. It's like when you throw a pebble into a pond, a ripple effect goes out. So every action causes a reaction and a ripple. And th this track here, the mountain lion, is a keystone predator. And that's one of my passions, is to track large predators. <laughs> I love just being on the trail of a mountain lion or a wolf or a grizzly bear and feel that adrenaline and feel that connection. Because you know what? Tracking is the oldest science known to humankind. And even though we've forgotten how to track, how to um, track for survival, because our survival depended on it. Our survival depended on being able to uh, follow an animal to our food source, being able to listen to the bird language, immersing in our senses to make sure we weren't being attacked <laughs> by a lion or a leopard. Um, so these predators play a key role in the ecosystem as well. And this is me as, as a teenager. <laughs> and this picture was taken uh, right before I was to set off on a trek. So part of my nature school was um, to spend a lot of time alone. And I would go on long treks alone, following the trails of an animal. Sometimes I wouldn't come back. I would build a little shelter and stay out there in a fire. And I would gather wild food. Um, and I would stay out there for days, just immersing and learning. And um, so on this particular day, um, I, was, I found a fresh trail of uh, alpha wolf. And uh, I followed that trail. And I followed, th it, this was in um, the largest uh, roadless uh, wilderness in the lower 48 states. Um, and I followed that trail all day. I followed it uh, on the edge of meadows. Uh, the wolf traveled along sheep trails, uh, went up a ridge. And 
there was at one point where I was uh, internalizing the rhythm of that animal because when you're tracking, you're so in the present moment that thought sort of disappears and you're just really immersed in your body. Um, and at one moment when I was at the apex of a hill, um, it was just after a light uh, rain had come down. Um, it was just minutes afterwards, and I was looking at the track in front of me, and the rain had fallen on top of that track. So I was right on the trail of that wolf. And um, when I finally caught up to that wolf, um, he led me to their rendezvous site, where the pack of 11 wolves had gathered. And uh, this is where he led me. And I, as I was sitting in the stream, resting after my long trek, um, I heard the ravens calling. And so I went to explore, and I found this majestic bull elk submerged in the oxbowing creek. And just this realization came over me at that moment that the cycle of life and death is all around us. And if we can learn to really enhance that cycle, because as the wolves come into an area where the meadow ecosystem is, where those, all that, that plant life is, where the herds of elk are, they hunt those herds, those large herds, and those herds move on and they keep bunched together. Their behavior changes when the predators are around. And their behavior changes, and then in turn, the grasslands change. And it's called a trophic cascade, and it's been studied extensively in Yellowstone National Park, um, where when they introduce wolves, all of a sudden, the biodiversity exploded. The plant life came back, and the songbirds came back. The beavers came back because the wolves were shifting the behavior of the herbivores. So the predators were shifting the behavior of the prey, and the prey was shifting the behavior of the plants. And then what we'll learn later is that actually shifts what's happening underground in the soil. So regenerative farmers, what's a regenerative farmer? Well, one of the things is we move. We're, we're always moving. You know, we're on, at an unprecedented time in our culture right now where there is so much sedentarism that it's people are, instead of running and squatting and picking fruit, we're like this, right? So the key to regenerative agriculture is we move. We move the animals just like the wolves move those herds of elk. And if you think about it, there is no intact, ecological, healthy system devoid of animals. So animals are integral to our food systems. Um, we move the chickens. <laughs> we move the chickens every day, and that's one of the things. Um, I wake up at you know usually 5 a.m., and I'm out there, and uh, these chickens are out at, on the pasture. And every day, we drag these heavy shelters, and we move, we move them, and so every day, they're on fresh grass. And what do they leave behind? They leave behind that fertilizer, and they leave behind that food, because in nature, there is no pollution. There is no such thing as waste. Waste is equal to food. And we're finally discovering, because soil science is, I mean, it's just such an incredible, vast amount of information that we're still discovering species that are, are in the soil and species that are interlinked with our entire uh, ecosystem and functioning of the climate. And the carbon cycle is key. The biological solutions are key to getting us out of this climate crisis that we are facing. So I know the question is going to come up. It always does. What about the methane, <laughs> right? Well, in North America, there was 30 million bison and 10 million elk, and they all produce methane, right? Did we have this climate problem when there was vast herds? No, we didn't, because nature has a solution for it. There's methanotropes. There's bacteria in the soil that absorb that methane. So what happens when you take animals 
off of the landscape and put them into a factory farm and put them into confinement, away from that natural ecosystem where there is that cycling and that function. Then you get pollution, then you get waste. So instead of saying, you know, putting more regulations onto your farmers and saying, you know, don't, you know, you can't raise livestock, you're vilifying the cow. It's like, you know, these these cattle, they're in these sheep, they're, you know, they're beautiful. <laughs> why would we why would we want to get rid of them in our lives? I mean, just by touching them and being around them and having our kids interacting with the animals, it makes them so happy and increases the diversity in their gut microbiome. We need more. We need more that is higher quality. We just need a different way to think about livestock and a different way to steward the wild and to manage the livestock by mimicking nature. So this is my daughter and uh, she also works really hard and she's very dirty there and she uh, is very proud that um, she's the only first grader that knows how to build fence. And um, so this is uh, our sh flock of sheep and it's, uh, being, they're being grazed um, on a vegetable farm. And so we like to say, use meat to grow your vegetables, <laughs> because if the animals weren't there, then what would the farmer need to do? They would need to import the fertilizer. They would need to bring the compost in from off-site, which would ha you know, use more fossil fuels and more energy. So what does the farmer do? You know, he has this land with very poor soil health, and he's transitioning that into organic, diversified vegetables to sell at farmer's markets. And so he calls me up and says, Donica, I really need your sheep. <laughs> I really need to bring this soil back into fertility so that I can grow those minerally rich vegetables that the chefs in San Francisco love the taste and the flavor that comes from the soil. So um, we're on a three-year uh, rotation in each field. So um, we, we move the animals within the field, but then uh, every three years the sheep come back to that field. So they graze the cover crop, and this is a, a mix, uh, mixed cover crop, but uh, there's Sudan grass there. And uh, it, he's just amazed at the results because uh, the sheep come in, they, they graze, they're like the ultimate biological farming unit. You know, they, they mulch with their feet, they graze, you know, they've got this carbon fermentation vat, they fertilize out the back end, and it's 100% solar power. You're not having to sit on a diesel tractor, and uh, you know, they, they're, they're mowing your cover crop for you. So uh, those kinds of partnerships of how can we be creative? How can we grow more food? How can we stack agriculture? How can we um, you know, run the cattle through a field because they'll graze certain things and then run the chickens through? And these chickens, by the way, are incredibly tasty. And you know what? They can actually walk. You know, have you seen the confinement house chickens? They, they can only waddle around because they're, they're uh, bred to grow so fast that their bone structure can't actually support their weight. Um, so this is a breed that originated in France, the Poulet Rouge, and uh, they're incredibly flavorful. So then you bring the chickens in and they debug your pastures. Um, and then the sheep as well form, have another role. So... Stagnation, just like in humans, if we're sedentary, that leads to, all, leads to all kinds of problems in our bodies. Well, stagnation in the grasslands also leads to oxidation and desertification. Because if there's not disturbance, if you're not bringing in that animal impact, then what happens is a monoculture. One species thrives and the others uh, don't. Um, so... Regenerative farmers move the animals, and then the animals move the plants. So that's us on horseback moving our herd of belted Galloway cattle, a heritage breed, and uh, moving them to fresh pasture and letting the pasture behind them recover. Because the key to storing carbon in the soil is what we should all have learned in primary school is the process of photosynthesis. And what you want to do is 